So I'm a community cardiologist uh, working in Bracebridge uh, and a Newfoundlander, so that alone is a risk factor for cardiac disease. <laughs> and in my training in cardiology, what we've always been taught and always been touted in cardiology is look how great cardiology is with the risk factors identified in the 60s and all these various interventions, the intervention, the, the uh, development of the defibrillator, how we can save people. And of course, the, uh, the uh, public health people say, oh, hold on now, it's actually more of a, our big steps in reduction in cardiovascular mortality come from people being better educated. I believe more in the latter, but of course, since I've been programmed to think this, as a cardiologist, uh, there is a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, discovering that you're own area is particularly biased. So what we have though, talk about elephants in the room, is despite all our fancy stents and devices and cardiology's very big bill on our tax system, we had this very uncomfortable reality that even when we treat people as good as we can, and some of the best centers are in Canada, out around the corner on University Avenue, get people into the cath lab, give them the stents, give them the drugs, and send them home, often with the false idea that you're fixed now. Uh, we got this very uncomfortable fact that uh, you know one in four to one in five of people followed up who take all the right medications, statins, aspirin, uh, and so forth, still have a recurrent cardiovascular event. And this is, as we know, is a very deadly situation because as often, depending on what research you quote, as many as one in three present as their first symptom of cardiac disease is sudden death. So this is a vicious, nasty disease, as many people here have been touched by. If, 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 you're a, if your coronary stenosis or your risk for rupture whistled as it got more narrowed or gave you some kind of a warning sign, maybe heart disease wouldn't be as dangerous, but this son of a gun is often no sign, and it kills very young people as well. Um, I'm not a research person. I don't have a strong academic background. I, I passed medical school. <laughs> so, so, so really, well, you know what they call the guy who graduated last, right? A doctor, you know, so, anyway, so, I didn't graduate last, I'd like to let you know, second last, but not really. So, so what we're trying to build up, of course, is, is developing this passion that we, we have gotten to this realization of the importance of looking at what we eat to affect our outcomes. So it is a bit of a passion project, as you can feel from a lot of the presenters so far, is that we want to show the science, but we also sort of really feel in our hearts, as used upon, where we need to be, which is obviously meds are not going to make us healthy. So we want, to, we want to obviously advance the science in order to be able to better inform the policy makers. And also, in my case, try not to get too upset about all the lobby effects and so forth. So I'm up here trying to not use any vulgarity because I'm a Newfoundlander and it de-stresses me, but I haven't dropped the F-bomb yet. <laughs> so I think what the studies do show so far, from my grab of it, is that it may not be able to identify the most perfect healthy diet, although they can in small studies. And my colleagues in cardiology say, oh yeah, Shane, those results are impressive, but they're only in 18 patients. They're only in 200 patients. It's not like our 20,000 patient studies that show statins save lives. Okay, but what it does show that if you veer away from a whole food plant-based diet with no added oil, which again we hold up as a gold standard in our hearts, yet to be largely proven by big randomized controlled trials that we can throw around at cardiac uh, um, conferences, is that if you veer away from that, you run into trouble. So, um, you know, if you add increased red meat, and do the reverse, you get trouble. If you increase high fat, which is now all the big trend on Google, yes, you reduce weight, uh, people sometimes will improve some markers, and then they die sooner, which is an important absence in some of the media. <laughs> of this, you know. Recently, my friends uh, Shoba and Arjun were, were interviewed by CBC Radio, and they sort of put the high fat, low carb diet as, and now we hear the, you know, the alternative side of the story, but they fail to forget that the stuff will kill you. Uh, I stumbled across this realization that they didn't teach me all the right things in medical school by uh, being on Amazon one night, making Jeff Bezos a little more rich, I came across the China study book and then dug into that research a bit more um, and realized that, wow, this, this information that less animal products and more plant-based products will reduce chronic disease has really shown up 
all through history, and uh, certainly in the past 50 to 40 to 30 years, it's quite strong. And when luckily now with this renewed interest in this area and awareness, I think largely started out by the work of Colin Campbell to bring it more mainstream, which again, you know, like <laughs> the reality is having really smart people in research institutions find out this information is critical, but you also got to get people to get it to the general public. And maybe sometimes, I know we argue about what's the best way to get the message out, sometimes you may need to shock people, you know, and you may need to get a bit controversial because you're dealing with a very, very powerful lobby of beef and dairy, and these lobbies have a huge, huge budget. So us just producing studies without looking at how we're going to get this information out is, is I think, is a really important issue. So I'm really excited that we're starting these Canadian-based, plant-based uh, conferences. And again, thanks for the invite. Uh, that's basically what the China study showed, although this is in different countries, showing that, again, try to avoid anything with a, with a face or a mother. <laughs> and and, and as, as Dr. Esselstyn points out, some very interesting historical data that who would have thought that you know, Nazi Germany was good for public health? <laughs> well, when they invaded Norway and took over a lot of the animal-based products, the rates of cardiac disease and sudden death went down. Now, we all know from other data that increased stress increases cardiac disease, and being occupied by Nazi Germany is probably like, not like going to Club Med. <laughs> so just look at this value. So a lot of signals down through history that point towards uh, that this is a significant issue. The nurse's health study and the uh, doctor's health study has been a treasure trove of information for us. <laughs> Maybe the information that this provided was nearly as important as what the work that nurses and doctors do every day. And from, from various types of analysis, we, we see what are risk factors for, for dying. One thing is getting older, so if you can stop from getting older, <laughs> that would definitely be beneficial. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is the number of uh, sugar units in your diet, which again tend to link with the amount of processed food, as, as Sue has mentioned. And the amount of increased fiber in the diet uh, is critically important to actually reduce your risk of death. So uh, these numbers are, are significant, and these are in, uh, I don't remember how many participants, over 50,000 participants. So again, the message is, is the more sugar, added sugar in your diet, the higher rate of cardiovascular mortality. And sorry I had to run through a lot of these because I was too uh, loose with the slides. Another really important information that was also mentioned by Dr. Ganguly again is the information we have out of Loma Linda and the uh, Seventh-day Adventist group. Don't want to make this religious, but the Seventh-day Adventist group again is as part of their belief is generally to stay away from animal-based products. And the registries that these, uh, that these uh, information things then give us on the prediction of, of what will happen has been tremendously valuable. Basically here, in terms of a risk ratio, if the more close you get to a completely plant-based diet, including taking dairy and fish out of your diet, yes, people say, Newfoundlander, you don't support fish. Well, we gotta look at the data. And a diet free of animal products basically reduces the risk of hypertension by 70, potentially by 75%. And hypertension is one of the number one reasons people see a doctor, one of the number one reasons people take medications and ultimately cost the system money and the strokes and early deaths will obviously cost people's uh, uh, you know, quality of life and life itself. So this is tremendously uh, powerful data, again showing in the ability to reduce all-cause mortality um, and cardiovascular disease by, by vegetarian dietary patterns. The same goes for blood pressure uh, reduction. Actually, I, I totally re, uh, revamped my idea of blood pressure. I know sodium has been shown to be a factor that drive up blood pressure, excessive sodium intake. As does smoking increases it, alcohol in the short term may reduce but ultimately lead to an increase in incidence of hypertension. I think it's due to an autonomic uh, sort of toxicity in the body. But I see now, really, uh, in my practice from one observation, which is hard to sort of make any major conclusions because they're not clinical trials, they're just observation, that I see blood pressure as much the same as diabetes, which I think is a fat toxicity more than anything else, and that the sugar elevation in diabetes is a marker, a secondary consequence related to, you get somebody on a low-fat diet, and many of these problems go away. The number, the amount of money spent here, this is U.S. data from 2007, the Medicare budget, um, uh, you know, $433 billion. 58% uh, of that budget in the United States back then was related to hypertension. So if you extrapolate the data here, 
saying you can reduce the incidence by 25%, the amount of money that you can spend, that you could save, is obscene. Because the more recent data is for 2020 estimated that the, how's that for a research budget, Dr. Jenkins? <laughs> Nearly, and, and of course, as to quote our friend Donald Trump, nobody even knows what a trillion is. <laughs> Well, it's getting very close to that number that even Donald Trump can't understand. Anyway, so, so if you could take the amount of money that actually is spent on hypertension, uh, basically, and reduce it by 75%, you could cut the Medicare budget just on hypertension alone by one quarter. So, you know, if we could run a $5 million clinical trial with very intensive support to patients, I think uh, it would be literally a drop in the bucket to show that this is... Uh, that this is the way to go. So that's the research we need to have. Uh, more, more studies here. Um, again, proving that, okay, can you tell me exactly the healthy diet? Well, scientifically, based on the randomized controlled trials and the size of them, I still got a lot of cardiologists who I think are justifiably doubtful, saying, yes, Esselstyn did an amazing job. Ornish did an amazing job. But they're small patient studies, and they want big studies. Again, I may not be able to tell you the perfect diet, but I can tell you when you deep fry everything in a su southern eating pattern, you're going to increase your death quite significantly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like when somebody comes to me and, with a chest pain, and the question is, well, doc, can you, can you tell me it's not hard? Can you tell me what it is? It's harder to do clinically to tell somebody what it is than to tell them what it's not. So if we do the appropriate testing, we can say with a lower chance that the chest pain is probably not cardiac. Maybe it's related to heartburn. But it's very difficult to outline exactly the, the direction to go, but it's much easier to outline the direction not to go. It's much like a philosophy about running a business or a marriage. Sometimes it's hard to make it better, but it's really easy to make it worse. <laughs> um, Kim Williams, the ex-president ex of the ACC, no relation, he's from Chicago. Uh, he calls it, maybe we shouldn't call it coronary disease, maybe we should call it culinary <laughs> disease, which I thought was, was, was interesting. The other big trend, of course, is this low-carb, high-protein diet, which is killing people early. And showing that, again, these eating patterns, because, of course, with the macronutrients, and keep in mind, all your total calories is a circle. So when you <laughs> drop your carbohydrate, which in a healthiest diet, is about 80% carbohydrate, mostly unprocessed carbs. Inevitably, the protein and fat component has to come up to make sure for the calories. And it shows that it'll kill you 22% faster as compared to uh, a, you know, a, a regular dietary pattern. And some of these numbers are compared to a standard American diet. So if, seriously, if your diet is more dangerous than a standard American diet, <laughs> you probably should be eating a diet of, a diet of like styrofoam or something. <laughs> Same thing in, in bigger studies showing that people with pre-existing coronary disease, the low-fat or the high-fat diet is even more dangerous, so driving up all-cause mortality um, by nearly 50, over 50%. Red meat consumption, red meat's not doing so well today on the, on the, uh, on the uh, you know, response in terms of we know and the data is, is definitely clear that this stuff will increase your risk if you swap out red meat for plant-based proteins, even small amounts, you get dose response curves that actually reduce risk of death. A little bit of a delay in the response there. Okay. okay. And this is, again, what we like to see in science is that if you smoke five cigarettes, you die at a certain rate. We'd like to see, although this sounds sadistic, if you smoke 20 cigarettes, we can show that you'll die even quicker. So we like to see the dose response curve to confirm that these numbers are just not a, a spurious result and a, and a statistical error. If you uh, switch out, as I mentioned, um, let me just remind myself now. This is a this is a uh, this is from the Nurses Health Study as well. Over 100,000 participants uh, determining what the hazard ratios for all cause and specific cause mortality. And again, a high protein intake positively associated mortality especially when that protein comes from processed red meat. And, uh, and when you substitute your plant proteins for the red meat, the mortality goes the opposite way. This is uh, tremendously powerful data in over 100,000 patients, again showing that things with a mother or a face will increase your risk for death. This is just another representation of over, again, over three million years of patient follow-up. I won't go through all of these. 
Uh, I will talk about Ornish, which of course uh, has you know, their work, and Dr. Esselstyn from the Cleveland Clinic, Ornish from UCLA. When I was in training, when people would mention or Ornish, uh, it was also, it was often met with a sort of, yeah, whatever, like maybe the results are real, but even if you can, uh, even if it is real, can anybody really stick to an Ornish diet? Again, I think it's heavily dependent and alluded to here earlier that our first step needs to be education, and education with the general population. Right? It wouldn't be good, you know, the alcohol process didn't work. It's not good to ban red meat, because people will find it somewhere. And it might be on the back of my hide, so I don't want to do that. So, so we don't want to ban it. But we've got to educate the general population. And I find in my small practice, if you spend time educating people, the cynical physicians next to me say, oh, they won't change. They won't make a difference. When you educate people, you're, I'm often very surprised what commitment people are willing to make to dietary habits and their lifestyle. Are you going to make everybody super healthy if everybody knew exactly what to do? No. If everybody, lots of us got Bibles on our shelves, but we don't follow it. So the point is, just because we know ideally what to do is not the solution. But if you have a group of people who are not properly educated, or worse, getting their education from social media and, sorry, CBC, then, um, <laughs> then you're going to have a whole bunch that's confused. So Ornish had a small group, but showed very, very uh, strongly that his ability to change the actual coronary stenosis, which again was always the holy grail of cardiology, how big your narrowing is. Well, like many stories, we realize on the further study, how big the hill is is not near as important as, as how unstable that plaque is. And so you could have a 90% narrowing in your artery, and it may be very calcified and not particularly at risk for rupture. The thing that's dangerous could be the 20% narrowing that's very soft, has a very soft top plaque, could rupture and, and kill a patient. But this is an important outcome. And the five-year follow-up in terms of, uh, in a very small number of studies, that showed a very high, uh, much higher ratio of cardiac events in patients who didn't follow the diet. This is some of the results here. I mean, one of my favorite people in this whole area, uh, now made famous uh, as a movie star from Forks Over Knives, is uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. He's a, a lovely person as well, and, and I had the honor to host him at an immersion uh, down in the Caribbean, which I'll tell you about. But uh, just a solid, solid uh, man. And he did an interesting 12-year longitudinal study. Again, small numbers of patients, 24 were entered. He asked Cleveland's cardiology to send them patients. Careful what you ask for. He, he asked he asked him to send him sick patients, and wow, did he ever get sick patients? Many of these patients were not expected to live longer than 12 months, so they basically were palliative cardiac patients. He followed them for uh, more than 12 years and continues to follow them. And interesting, these were a sick group of patients with a lot of coronary events, nearly 50 coronary events in the eight years leading up to meeting Esselstyn and joining a study. They followed 18. The other six or whatever, I guess, got tired of his military attitude and couldn't follow the diet and went home. But of the 18 that followed and the folks who were compliant, there was essentially no future vascular events. So the, sorry to use a sort of a tagline for, uh, it sounds like a, an advertisement, but he effectively made those people heart attack proof. And the one that wasn't compliant, like many of us, sometimes you get a little bit sloppy even if you have a good stretch where you do real well, he actually developed unstable angina, then went back to a plant-based diet, and within six weeks, his unstable angina went away. So if you call that an event, that's sort of like a non-adherence issue, really. He had tremendous results, albeit small. We've all seen these very sexy pictures of improved uh, coronary artery uh, lumens and so forth, and you know, um, this is amazing stuff. And then more recently, in, he uh, decided to take 200 patients who recently survived a cardiac event, because your risk for a cardiac event is highest when you've had a previous one, which is philosophy for about anything in biology. So he had educated those 200 patients and wanted to answer a few questions. One is, how many people are going to be adherent to his diet 3.8 years out? And the results, the compliance rate was uh, about 90% people were compliant with the diet. So this is a doable diet. And more importantly, is how many people actually uh, what their five-year event rates are. Because remember I told you at the beginning, the number of people who we lose with another vascular event, despite our best, most high-tech, and most expensive treatments, is very high at one in four to one in five people. 
And uh, the results here, by the way, before that, 112 had chest pain. It improved in 104 of those. Many of them avoided uh, the cardiac uh, surgical suite. And, and weight loss uh, was also very significant, not surprising. The major cardiac events, keeping in mind a baseline at five years, about 20% of those who ignore diet, 0.6%. So not good for the drug business. Uh, third, and those 21 who weren't adherent, they had a particularly high recurrent event. So this was a sick group of patients uh, who survived their heart attack, went home on the best medical therapy and had been given the best stents or bypasses appropriate. And uh, just look what, what food can do. So I get again my colleagues who say to me, okay, but that's in small patients. Yes, but do you really think that if you did a patient, uh, 5,000 or 25,000 patients, that this treatment effect, so huge, would literally go to you know, equal poise and zero, zero? Uh, very unlikely. So I think ethically, okay, and we're talking about, I know I gotta be careful about you know, value judgments here, but ethically, I think medicine now needs, has, has an ethical responsibility of a, of a lot of skepticism thrown to me by my colleagues, an ethical responsibility, and get ready and do your beepers, uh, that, to prove that Essison's data is bullshit. I really think medicine has an ethical responsibility now to prove that this is not such an important, such an important treatment event because the expense, the amount of suffering that could be avoided, even if the reduction in event rates are not 95 plus percent, maybe it's only 40 percent. That still, that would still be the biggest intervention we could possibly do. So this was his uh, results in graphic form. We know that as your cholesterol levels go up, your vascular risk goes up as well, to keep it simple. I mentioned Paul Ridker as well, showed this, and uh, from Dr. Jenkins' work, uh, he was mentioned the CRP, a measure of in inflammation. So if, if you got high inflammation and high LDL, that's not the place where you want to be selling life insurance to that individual. <laughs> and uh, it's best to have inflammation and LDL low. And the numbers in between, again, prove that higher LDL, in general, means higher risk of death. We know, and we've been told, and sometimes the public media may even interpret that, my God, this stuff reduces event uh, vascular event rates so good, we should put it into drinking water. Yeah, please God, it never gets to that. This was an amazing study, however, that the drugs uh, showed that rosuvastatin did reduce uh, all-cause mortality, but again, Despite the use of these drugs, we still got that very high, uncomfortable rate of recurrent events. So I do believe, as would uh, even the small study of Esselstyn's work, many of these patients were on statins. I do believe in the role of statins. I do believe in the role of aspirin. But by coaching people to eat better, what we find is, obviously their cholesterol levels come much lower. So therefore, the amount of statin dose that they'd require would pre presumably be lower. And the amount of other medications, if you've also got high blood pressure that's poorly controlled or diabetes, if you can reverse or improve those, then the pharmaceutical load on the patient will be lower. And I'm an ex-pharmacist, so I know how potentially dangerous these drugs are. So I'd like to put pharmacy out of business too, but it will never happen. But at least if we can give them more you know, vacation time. <laughs> uh, this, was, uh, this was one of the studies by our esteemed colleague, Dr. Jenkins. Again, showing, okay, cholesterol drugs can do it, but can a diet do it? I know everybody here knows that a diet can do it. And uh, Dr. Jenkins mentioned his study before and showed, yes, diet can not only lower LDL, but can lower CRP and inflammatory markers. A uh, number of other summary studies showing in people with normal cholesterol levels, uh, they will drop cholesterol as well raising the idea of what is a normal cholesterol level. Because again, if, remember, if you're normal for Canadian cholesterol, you're probably too high in cholesterol. If you're normal for the amount of gun ownership you live in the US, you probably have too many guns. <laughs> this is a clinical trial summary of people with high cholesterol, and not surprisingly, it works even, it works even better. This is data from Colin Campbell's son, Nelson Campbell, who started the Plant Pure uh, programs, and in Mebane, North Carolina, uh, only 16 patients uh, they have, so very small numbers, but in 16 patients after, I think this was 10 days of a plant-based diet, dropped m nearly six pounds, significant cholesterol reduction uh, and triglyceride reduction as well. Um, I always trying to outdo somebody. Uh, we, had to, we had to then, this, and as an excuse to go somewhere warm. 
we decided in 2014 to try and register 43 participants that we got in November, and I uh, had the honor of hosting Dr. Campbell, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell's son Tom, and a number of other uh, speakers to this, to this situation. We did blood work at the beginning, then people ate their plant-based diet in a buffet style each day. We had a great time, and at day seven, we repeated blood work, blood pressure, and weights again. Uh, we had Dr. Campbell's daughter, Leanne Campbell. She's the author of the plant-based, or the uh, China Study Cookbook. She liaised with the kitchen staff. This was our very tall German chef who was in charge of the kitchen. Uh, this is a fa another famous VIP who will be speaking later today, Dr. <laughs> Radapudi. And, uh, and we had a great time. Uh, Jim Hicks spoke. We did some lectures during the day. It was hard to do lectures when it's 26 degrees outside, though. But anyway, we, we did it. Tom Campbell talking. Um, it was a beautiful area in Porta Plata, a little plug for Porta Plata tourism. Uh, Buffet-style plant-based diets. Uh, by the way, people could walk through the unhealthy food area, so I don't know if anybody went, went in for chicken wings, but we think most people were fairly adherent. Jim Hicks, by the way, uh, was one of our speakers as well. Notice Jim Hicks is carrying a book here, uh, 10 billion by uh, this guy Emmett, I think, who's a statistician and math guy who is talking about uh, population overgrowth, and he says uh, it's a fairly depressing message. So anyway, well, one of the books that Jim wrote with a family doctor from upstate New York was this four-leaf guide. I really like it. It's a summary book. You can read it in two hours. Because again, I think, I think what happens is I think the population tends to have a little bit of ADHD. We can't have a long, prolonged message, and maybe even if it's perfectly clear scientific research, we've got to condense it down into language that someone like me, a country doctor, can understand and, and translate it into people. So I think this is a really good book. I'm also plugging it too. This is my bias because uh, this is the only book my name is on because he let me give a little, uh, he let, gave me a little uh, a blurb about how good his book was. So I guess I'm in conflict of interest really. But anyway, there you go. And, and Amazon too. And Jeff Bezos has not paid me to say this. This is Colin's son, Tom Campbell, who's a family doctor in New York. He's doing great work. This is the, uh, uh, the very amazing Caldwell Esselstyn, 86 years old, like Colin Campbell, out riding his bike every day and, and still, uh, still spreading the message of plant-based nutrition. And most people know who Colin Campbell was. And these are other conference VIPs, Dr. Uh, uh, Drs. Arjun and Shoba, who are personal friends of mine. This is the results uh, in, in Grand Ventana in the Dominican Republic. So remember now, this is an all-inclusive, so there's an open bar. <laughs> so most all-inclusive weight gains are on average about seven pounds. So we dropped on average nearly two pound weight reduction in seven days. Blood pressure, eight over five, which again, the end of the uh, HOPE trial, at the end of three years, the average blood pressure reduction was four over two. So this is equivalent to nearly two blood pressure uh, pill difference. Fasting sugar came down by a quarter. Total cholesterol, more than 40%, and LDL by 36%. To put it in perspective, high-dose statins, if you got a result like this on high-dose statins at uh, 90 days, you'd be considered a very successful cardiologist. So this is what food can do in seven days. So like I like to say, is food is not as good as meds, it's better. <laughs> What's next? This is my Christmas list for uh, what we should have. So this is my uh, appeal to, to smart, academic-based research people like, uh, like Dr. Ganguly and, and Dr. Jenkins. So. Uh, Oh no, that's the end, sorry. I won't talk about uh, TMAO. This is a, an area of research of, okay, we know the red, red meat is bad, but why is it? I think it's important information to, to find this out. TMAO, again, mentioned earlier that the higher your TMAO level, the higher rate of major cardiovascular events. So the data is, is, is brewing. Another big area, another big reason why people get admitted to hospital, and especially as a cardiologist I see it, is congestive heart failure. So very exciting data emerging, showing that red meat consumption very strongly linked with congestive heart failure. It's okay. It's okay. Now this is my wish list and my final couple of slides. So this is my appeal to Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Ganguly and all the work they're doing at their uh, respective institutions, University of Toronto, St. Mike's, and McMaster. Thank God we had those individuals pushing a plant-based diet and getting behind and helping to help organize maybe more research around this area. Because this is my dream. The wish list is the following. A randomized controlled interventional trial comparing a, 
a no added oil, whole food, plant-based diet against a standard American diet or a standard Canadian diet, which probably is not a chance, is not a short uh, chance that this is related also to sudden cardiac death. <laughs> so I'd say 5,000, but considering the amount of money we could get from the dairy lobby if they didn't reroute the money there, it could be maybe 25,000. Maybe five years, $5 million uh, with very intense uh, support for 5,000 patients. We'll look at, put it in perspective, $5 million is 0.1% of the money that the federal government sets aside for the dairy industry this year alone. $3.65 billion went there and an extra $250 million to offset some of the screw-ups on the free trade agreement. So $3.9 billion this year, 0.1% would be this, a very easy trial to do. So maybe we could call, we could call our trial, I don't know, the St. Mike's McMaster plant-based trial, well, you can name it whatever you want. This is my dream and I think this is what we need and I think it should be done, again, because the results in these small trials are so significant. I think it behooves, which is the biggest word a Newfoundlander is allowed to use, <laughs> it behooves modern medicine and cardiology and preventative medicine to say, okay, you plant-based diet people who are often labeled as hippies, uh, your data is floofy and it's in small trials and it doesn't impress me. Okay, well then give us a small trickle out of your budget to show and prove it one way or another. Does plant-based diets make that much of a difference? Thank you.